And so I am delighted to be here with so many people who are working on the future of healthcare and technology and making the things that the people in the world truly, truly need. I believe that as healthcare innovators and healthcare leaders, you are central and so important to creating the future that we'd like to see in the world. And so it's such a wonderful life for me and such an honor um, to be here with you. So thank you very much. And so one of the great things about being in a room like this is that there's three things that I don't have to convince you of. One, I don't have to convince you that mental health is important. All of you know the stats very well and you understand the tsunami of mental health issues that we're seeing worldwide. Second, I don't have to convince you about the combination and the interaction between stress and illness because you see it in your patients and you see it in your patient data every single day. And the third thing is that I don't have to convince you about the connection and the importance of the impact of emotion and empathy. Your caregivers and you also see this in your work every day. What might surprise a group like you though is that typically when you think about your work, you might think of it as just healthcare and that's very important. But I would like to add what you are also doing is nothing short of human potential and affecting the great arc of human progress. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And so I'm an investor and I'm also a futurist. And so what this means is I think a lot about what does it take to create the abundant future and what does it take for us to become the people capable of creating the future, what is required, and how do we empower others to do this as well alongside of us? And so what does it take to have the conviction and the empathy and the creativity and the resource to bring this future into place? And so I'd like to talk about three things today. One is what is a transformative technology? And then two, I want to surprise you about something. And then three, I'm going to take you through my predictions. And so as Daniel asked, what's now, what's near, what's next? And I'm going to give you specific examples so we can get real tangible about this. And so my passion is asking, how can we use technology to unlock human potential? And I've asked this for 18 years through video games and I worked on major brands like World of Warcraft and Fortnite. And also I asked it for the last nine years as an organizer with transformative tech and as an investor in technology for human health and happiness. And candidly, when I look back through the lens of my life, I also asked it as a little black girl in Houston, Texas, daughter of a plumber, surrounded by no one really who looked like me and trying to understand where do I fit in? And candidly, if I'm also being really honest, I also asked it as a very lonely senior executive. Like when I read the stats about the loneliness academic, I remember that being very true for me and having the question, who am I? Where do I fit in? What can I create with this life of mine? And so what is transformative tech? It's really about the journey of human transformation, but what that looks like is tech for mental health. Because if you don't have health, and emotional health, because if you don't have health, you don't have the baseline. And then it's also tech for social and emotional wellness, because the reality is, if you don't have the ability to connect and collaborate, you cannot achieve greatness, because nothing can be created alone. All of us work with people. 
And then the third one on human potential and performance. What is your purpose? Where are we going? Because if we don't know where we're going, we don't have the conviction and we don't have the aim and we don't have the ability to step back and see how things are affecting the wider picture. And so this is the core problem. Our tech is all on exponential curves, but how we become healthy, happy adults, how we know what to do, how to be, is linear. And so it really sort of comes down to this. We don't know how to be, we don't know how to feel, and we don't know how to become. And we don't teach this in our society anywhere. You have to be very lucky. And many people, when they look at this, they think, well, technology is the problem. And it is in part. But the real master move is to look at how we might technology, use technology to push this curve and to empower ourselves and to enable ourselves to have this at scale. And so this is what the marketplace looks like. Today, you would call it wellness tech. That's sort of like the closest that you can get to it. But you can see when you read this, it's spread across several different categories that one might use to build up to the challenge and the problem of how do we affect the human mind? How do we, how do we touch it in different ways? And so, Today, if you look online, there's like over 20,000 mental health apps that are out there. And yes, we have to push and test on the efficacy and as well for wellness and, and all of the variety of different things you can have. I actually left my aura in my room, but we all, we're all wearing wearables. And I know Mike Snyder was here earlier and he has so many. And so it's sort of hidden across all of these different categories, but it really is how do we heal, how do we grow, how do we thrive, and there are real products, and there are real founders, and there's real science in these areas. And so what's really driving it? You might wonder, like, where's all the growth? Because on that previous slide, actually the Kager for wellness is 20%. That's a, that's a lot of movement. And so what's moving it, one, was COVID, put the pressure and the interest on mental health and wellness and consumer sentiment for wellness is undeniable. Two, remote work. Remote work has finally made enterprise interested in well-being and the top 100 CEOs say that their number one or number two most important issue is wellness, is well-being is what they consider it to be. And then, interestingly, chat GPT for emotional health. I have never seen people get so interested in my work because what's happening is people are looking at the generative AIs. The thought has arisen. Maybe we need to get good at being human. And that includes our human emotions. And so, What's great is that in the age of AI and the future of work and the future of health and the health crisis, finally, finally, social and emotional skills, social determinants of health, these things that were optional and nice and, oh, that's so nice that you're into that. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. It's moving from optional to required. And we're lucky because the technology is there to help us. The mind-body connection, science and technology is starting to track this and show this and we have the tools. And so we can move from self-care to healthcare. And we can move from only next-gen wearables to truly having mental health games for scale. And so my biggest prediction is this. One, we're gonna get a lot more interested in being human. 
and we're going to get generative. And what I mean by that is developing the social and emotional skills that allow us to really collaborate because we're going to have to do that in this future that's here. We're also going to get deeply embodied because we are going to start to work with the intelligence of our bodies. And when I say embodied, I also mean all the intelligence of the gut biome. I mean the intelligence that we have around our senses and our sensory perception. There's a whole category of embodied cognition in neuroscience. And I think we're going to pull that out and really look at it again as we look for what is our place with generative AI. And we're going to get emotional. And by that, I mean emotionally fluent because there is a difference between having emotions and having emotional fluency. And then we're going to get sensory because we actually have 51 senses if you add in perception and interoception and other things that have been shown to actually positively influence performance. And together, we're going to increase our human intelligence, our collaboration, and our potential. And my view on artificial intelligence is that we have neglected ourselves far too long. And now it's time to attend to our own human intelligence. And so we're going to do it across the stack. And the point that I want to make here is that the challenge and the problem that I've seen in healthcare products, in entertainment products, just across the board, is that most people, when they're designing for this, they see each of these layers as individual. They approach them as individual. And the problem with that, with not seeing it as a single design space, is that we get too siloed. There's been a couple of presentations where they've shown silos elsewhere. The point is this, if we include the physical layer in this and the way that we design for it, then we get the embodiment into the tech from the start. Some of the most successful tech products that are in this category are ones that have clinicians in the loop, ones that have counselors in the loop. And so you have tech products and then you have apps and you have wearables, but you have a person because someone thought that having the embodiment is important. Yeah. And so this is going to have ramifications across and implications across the products that are out in the marketplace, the ones that are coming, and then also across my six major predictions. And so, um, so we're going to have preventative health and mental fitness. Uh, what I'm really looking forward to is that we're going to get the data right, and we're going to start having data unions. And once these data unions come into place, we'll be able to have more trust. And when we have trust in the data unions, as opposed to different companies taking all of the data, then we will be able to have end-to-end -end solutions, fully integrated solutions that combine food and movement and environment and, and really sum up to get us to preventative health preventative mental fitness. We're also going to have intelligent food and microbiomes. And so I know we're just at the very beginning of it. I talked to Sachin out here, um, and they're looking at mental and emotional implications of gut biome. When I look at something like this, I really look at cognition and I look at mood because my, my focus is, is in that way, not just the the healthcare implications of this. And one of the hardest things is to actually take action once you've gotten a once you've gotten direction from some of these. And so what I expect to see is that you're going to start seeing and each of these actually has a mood implication. And so people are trying to get protein and tech right and what's the right thing to eat when you have uh, when you have a um, recommendation. And then I love what Vessel is doing, and they're also actually even looking at mood. Um, cognitive cities. So the cities of the future, um, it's going to go beyond smart. Smart is very old school. We're going to go into a place where the city is supporting you, and it's supporting your growth and development, because many people don't know sight, sound, smell, 
taste, temperature, they all affect your ability to focus and be productive. And so we're gonna have cognitive cities where the city is actually your friend. So instead of big brother, it'll be little sister and she's gonna be dedicated to you. In the future of work, it's gonna be where we go to come alive. It's gonna be where we go to go into group flow. And so you're going to see places where, where the offices are designed to lower the sound, increase the cohesion, increase the connection between the employees who are there. It'll be the place where the top performers want to go into the office because that's where they sink. Collaboration and sensory. I'm so bullish on human senses. Um, I, I, it's probably because I wanna have superpowers and uh, this is the way to do it. But sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and then biosynchrony. One of the things that you might not know is that when you're in flow with a team, actually your biosignals start to sync. So respiration, pupil dilation, and Corn Ferry did a study where they looked at 120 teams of top companies and they attributed 46% of success of those teams to synchrony, to synchrony, which is what we call chemistry. But there's a biosignal of it, which is fascinating because once we can see it, it means we can measure it and we can begin to touch it and shape it. And the last prediction is just, I'm incredibly bullish about what we can do with the metaverse and what we can do with games. Today, more than half of the world's population plays games. And games have the engagement, and, and you've heard many people talk about it today, so I'm not gonna spend that much time on it, but I believe that games and role-playing games and large games are actually the ultimate transformative tool because it's within a story, it's within an action, and we can communicate and teach many of the pro-social behaviors that we'd like to have. And it's not, it's not good for you games in a painful way. It's actually focusing on it in an enjoyable way. And so you're gonna hear from one of my portfolio companies a little bit later, Deepwell, and I just love the way that they're doing it. And so in conclusion, <coughs> You and your becoming your very best self. You're focusing on developing your own humanity. You're deepening your social emotional skills, your own potential. That is actually key to your contribution. You are the way to the end that we want. So I know we're all busy. Do not neglect yourself because you and your potential is essential to what you're creating and how you will connect with others and how you will build things. Because we have entered the age of the deepest human. So go deep and thank you.